be seen on the screen, you know, please just turn your camera off, if that's okay. Okay. This I'll... meeting is being recorded. Okay, great. So, welcome to our first public engagement talk as part of our current exhibition, Bloomberg New Contemporaries, which you can see at Humber Street Gallery and Ferenc Art Gallery until 27th of November. My name is Marianne Luz Listier, I'm the curator at Humber Street Gallery, and I'm really pleased to introduce Chisa Weber, who is one of the 47 artists selected by new contemporaries to be part of this exhibition. Her work, Cosmic Memento Black, can be seen in space to at Humber Street Gallery. Teresa was born in 1996 in Germany, Düsseldorf, and 2022 studies at the Royal College of Art. Teresa will be talking about her work for about 30, 35 minutes, after which we will be open to questions. Please either put your hand up or type your question into the chat, whichever is easier for you. Before, yeah, before we start, just again to say we are recording this session and if you don't want to be in the video, please turn your camera off. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Teresa. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you everyone for coming. It's such a pleasure for me to be here and talk about my practice as part of the New Contemporaries. Uh, today I'm going to talk about four shows that I made in the course of last year and this year and four concepts that kind of interconnect with each other. Um, so yeah, I'll jump right in. This, um, okay, I can't skip the slides. One second. I have to reshare the screen. Now it works. Okay. All right, the first show that I would like to talk about was last summer in a museum in Germany, it's called Museum Ludwig Aachen. And I had the opportunity to pick and choose from their collection um, to work with and to engage with. And I picked my favorite work by Jean-Michel Basquiat. I remember seeing this work in his big retrospective in Frankfurt. And I literally went back for this work because I was so fascinated by it. It, it, it um, it's a triptych. It's called Ishtar. In the middle, you can see something like a portrait, a mask-like drawing of Ishtar uh, with her name written. Um, it's a mythological figure and a Semitic Babylonian goddess, which to me is quite interesting because she's a female goddess of war, a goddess of fertility, femininity, but she can. Um, transform herself from being female to male and back. And it's, it's quite an interesting figure. So I decided to react on his work um, on a conceptual level. So I developed these three Easter altars with material collage and resin on metal construction and a Easter wallpaper um, behind it. So there's something like a temple-like situation and I would like to talk about the Ishtar wallpaper first. Um, the Ishtar wallpaper consists of four different motifs that I used uh, to make this kind of digital printed weaving. And the content is very connected to the mythology of the goddess Ishtar and the different topics that I'm pointing out with my altars. Um, so I'd like to talk about the the single individual motifs that I have. The first one is the historic stone sculpture of the goddess Ishtar, which I think is very interesting. And I think she's very beautiful in the way that um, she kind of embraces her femininity and, and holds, I think someone's got the microphone on <laughs> um, and holds her breasts in a way, in a very meditative, natural way. So a very unfetishized way. Um, and I, I just really like the shape and the curviness and it's very connected to other topics that I'm working on in my research. The second part of the wallpaper weaving is the background which is the Ishtar gate. So there is a historical gate called, uh, named after the goddess Ishtar in an old Babylonian city um, in Iraq. So nowadays it's Iraq, but this gate was 
was to, um, was taken to Germany and it's now placed in a museum in Berlin. It's called Gropiusbau, and I think it's it's very interesting how uh, you know it's it's a good example on um, power. One second, sorry, on um, looted art in general. It's quite interesting because this gate was finished in 2008. So the second half of the gate was brought to Berlin in 2008, which is quite late. And as a German artist, I think, yeah, I, I felt some type of responsibility to react on this other German institution within this German museum with my work. Um, the third motive is the lion, which I also took out of the Ishtar gate. And the lion is the symbol animal of the goddess Ishtar. And it's in general quite a loaded cultural motive, which is very interesting to me. It's also um, very, I think the shape is very similar to the lion of Judah, which is a very important symbol for resilience and power within the African diaspora and especially in Rastafarianism in Jamaica. So it's kind of a good example for these multi-layered cultural symbols. This is a detail of the wallpaper and you can see how I wove the motives together. And now the fourth motive is, as you can see, the horizontal line, uh, which is a self-portrait, so it's my face that I transformed and put in a horizontal. So kind of you get this infinite timeline of duplicates and I transformed my face with an Instagram filter, which is something quite contemporary to do. And I've got these multiple mouths and big eyes. Uh, and my face starts to look kind of mask-like. So it was interesting for me. I just wanted to include it, these different temporalities and um, yeah, I wanted to mention this Instagram filter. Okay. Now we're getting to the first altar piece. This altar is called Transformation. It's specifically like in particular about the goddess Ishtar being able to transform and um, the work consists of silicone impression of bodies, um, silicone pads, pearls, nails, and silicone with my finger imprint in it, chains, and everything into resin with glitter and rosaries. So it's kind of, and then these nipple pasties, of course, it's kind of connecting fetishized elements with spiritual religious elements, which I thought is interesting in terms of mythology. And, um, and as you can see, the bodies aren't necessarily male or female. It's very much about the fluidity and potential, I think in general, within these mythological figures that are, they're allowed to be so complex. And I think um, all of us, I, I look at the individual as a network and a complex layered um, a network. So yes, the second altar is, okay. The slide doesn't skip, one second. I have to reshare the screen again. Sorry for this. This should work now. Okay. The second altar is called, um, is titled Markers of the Female, and it's focusing on the embracement of feminine attributes. You can see long synthetic hair, partly braided, nails, rosaries again, glitter, liquid pigment, and silicone with my finger imprint in it. Um, it's kind of, for me, it's, it's quite important to, you know, I'm trying to decode these very feminine elements and look at them as, as strength and also trying to see strength in the vulnerability of these materials. And um, I think coming very much from a non-white feminist history and recording in progress. And um, I think in general, the, uh, the resin 
and how I'm trying to archive these arrangements within resin is, is something like an archive, as I said, and the resin is not just holding the material, but also protecting the material. So yeah, this link is a direct, this work is a direct link to the, the goddess of femininity, the goddess Ishtar. The third altar is called Ishtar Gate, which is um, again directly linked to the uh, Ishtar Gate, just as the title says. I made these blue tiles. They're kind of floating within the resin. Also, I printed the lion and transformed the lion uh, on translucent foil, so it's quite nuanced. You can't see it on the first side, but it's in there. And I'm trying to, um, you know, look at the look at the architecture more openly and trying to have it um, something floating and timeless, an homage to to the Ishtar Gate. Okay, I am now going to talk about my second show. It was a solo show in Cologne that I made last year. This is just one corner of the show. But you can see my Cosmic Memento works on the wall and then a work on the floor, which was called um, Anima Mundi. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to start with Cosmic Memento Black, which is the show that I'm showing for new contemporaries. And quite an important work for me so I'm quite happy to be showing it. It's about the potential of infinite spaces and the dark matter within the deep sea and the universe. So it's trying to connect these two poles that we have, uh, the deep sea and the universe. And there's different layers that kind of, it's quite poetic, I think, um, kind of add to each other. You can see hair, pearls, fingernails, um, print on foil, chain, and then a drawing of maybe you can see it on the it's hard to see it on the photo but maybe on the darker areas of the work which are fictive star signs and um yeah glitter and resin as i said it's about the potential of infinity of these spaces that humans can't reach and humans can't oppress it's quite important for the imaginary of different mythology uh, mythologies as for example atlantis in the deep sea and um, the idea of that black people and black bodies survived in the deep sea and found this peaceful place for themselves and kept on sort of living and surviving in Atlantis. And then also when you look at the universe, the mythology of like astrology in general, just as example for, you know, something that gives you um, hope and strength. And I think it's quite, up to date because astrology is quite you know limitless and timeless and then other than that i think the work is very much about this play between light and darkness and the um idea of i think in general western expansion and, and western science trying to enlighten everything and x-ray everything in order to understand it and put it into categories uh, as you know in opposite to opacity in general like untransparency the dark spaces and how how strong it can be actually to be untransparent also how it works with thought rights like we all have the right for opacity we don't owe anyone an explanation on who we are i think it's very much about the right for opacity in this work and then exactly, oh yeah, um, this is a photo. I was thinking in Cosmic Memento Black, I was also thinking about uh, shining plankton in the ocean. And um, when you look at it from the universe, it actually looks like a shining, uh, you know, sky full of stars. And the idea of like, when you, when you look at the earth from the universe and it looks like a sky full of stars, and when you look back, it looks the same. So this idea of like having two poles and they look very similar from the from a distance, but they're so different and individual when you go closer is quite interesting because there are so many shapes and forms that keep repeating themselves within nature and the cosmos. So 
I was, as I said, thinking about these poles, trying to bring them together as something nuanced and complex. And this is Cosmic Momento Black. Uh, sorry, I just talked about Cosmic Momento Black. This is Cosmic Momento Blue. Mm, blue for me is a very symbolic color. Again, it plays an important role in, in terms of, you can feel blue, you can feel the blues. I think blue is a very cool color. Um, the history of indigo blue is very loaded. There's, there's a long history of indigo blue um, within countries of the global south. There's history of slave labor within the uh, indigo pigment production in the Caribbean and South US. And blue is the color of desire as it's the color of the sky and the sea. So it's kind of the infinite color as well. You can also see a drawing I mean, obviously you can see this big half translucent deep sea fish again, which is quite central, uh, which again is about this play between transparency and visibility, darkness and light. On the left side, you can see um, an Amazonian warrior that I draw as um, something like a star, star sign drawing again, a fictive one. And then the pink lines are fictive star signs again. And you can see here, parts of silicone, fingernails, little pearls, uh, pull into the resin. Mm. Yes. The floor piece that you saw before, as I said, is called Anima Mundi. It's Latin for soul of the world. And that time, that time I was researching on Western death masks and, um, the idea like, and the materiality of plaster and marble and the, the idea of the pure white within that material. And um, I started to make a series of masks, like of faces of people that are very important for me and close to me with this translucent silicone. But I implanted objects again, like pearls, rosaries, nails, pigment and try to break up this kind of pure white surface. And then I pulled it into resin to make it part of my fluid archive and to protect it again and embedded it into this, um, this tile ground. And the indigo blue again is about the, the, the meaning of the blue that I mentioned before. And again, it's a hint to the Ishtar gate that I also talked about before. So it's kind of a link to that, but it becomes this fluid architecture. These works are in the same show. It's when you go around the corner and they're called altar windows. As you can see, my titles kind of interconnect with each other as well. The altar windows are like big networks uh, of ropes, synthetic hair, pigment, prints, pearls, nails, modeling masks, etc. And there are links to different other works that I made. Uh, in the front piece, you can see a little print of the goddess Easter or the self portrait with this Instagram filter. On the back piece um, over there, there's the lion again. Um, and these works are very much about, as well, about complexity and the nuances of being and living in the diaspora and um, trying to archive the outside. Uh, the outsides of the work are flat and the insides are kind of relief-like. So it looks like the material actually melts out of the resin and com comes back to the presence. Um, and yeah, for these works, I think because just of, because of the scale, it looks, it works a little different from my smaller resin pieces. They are two and two meters large and very heavy. So they got 200 kilos each. And uh, they really work like a macro system, like a complex universal system of mapping, cartography. And when you zoom in, you could, 
look at it like a microscopic perspective. So it's got this micro um, cosmo and the macro cosmos. Again, linked to the exhibition title, Cosmic Momento. And also it's quite important for me that you can't ever see everything in the work at the same time because it's so detailed and I'm trying to, you know, make it quite opaque and infinite. Also the inside of the resin is very important that the resin is transparent and it's got this inside body and um, these layers on layers. So there's a lot of potential for infinity. That's the second word, version of the work. So it could be hanging from the ceiling or standing on the ground. Um, yeah, I was actually going um, to show these for the new contemporaries as well, but we didn't, we couldn't ship them. It was just too complicated. So it's nice to talk about it today at least. Okay, the third work that I'm going to talk about is the transformation gate. This was a show in a private museum in, in Dusseldorf. And as you can see, I worked with the Ishtar wallpaper again as basis for the new concept and thinking about the gate. Um, so I developed this kind of anti-gate, like an anti-architecture, which is, you can walk through, but it's not an architecture. It's more like an uh, assembly or collage. And this group show was, it was called Attempts to be Many. And it was very much about the concept as, uh, the collage as concept. So like the pot political potential within assembly and collages in terms of uh, complexity, multiplicity and nuances. Uh, the Ishtar gate is a collage on chains hanging from the ceiling and you can see prosthetics, ele prosthetic elements, body enlargements, again, like silicone prosthetics, synthetic hair, uh, little objects that I made, some tiles and rests of older installations. And the larger parts are prints on foil. So they're half translucent again uh, with silicone added on it. So like a material collage on these foils. That's an example, you can see it better here. You can see pearls, fur, synthetic hair, Again, it's about a certain type of femininity. Um, and the complexity of layers. So, you know, it would kind of, everything melts together with the wallpaper. Mm. I also made two paintings for this show, which I integrated into the wallpaper. My paintings are made out of silicone and material collage. Like you can see um, pearls, fingernails, synthetic hair and prints as well. And then there's rests of fabric and other little things from my accumulation from my personal little archive. And um, the composition to me is again, something like a mapping or cartography or uh, um, like a vi visual version of a feeling. But also, as you can see, I work with the grid in a very organic way. And I look at the grid as something like um, a landscape, like the grid as colonial landscape and plantation, which I'm trying to open up and like, it's kind of seeking for reinvention. This is the second painting. This, this one is called Hybrid and this one's called Mosaic. Um, again, as you can see, I integrated the, the print from the wallpaper and tried to make it uh, layer it together and nuanced. About the fingernail itself might be interesting that I, and I think body extensions as in general, I look at them as body traces and painting. And I think that's the core definition of painting that it's a trace. So I look at these um, body enlargements as body traces in my paintings. And um, the fingernail is, I think for me quite an interesting object because 
in, in Caribbean femininity is, is very prestigious and feminist to have long nails just because not just there's many reasons, but also because it's, it's distancing you from physical labor. And it's very different from the performance of feminism in Western countries where long nails are not very feminist in a way. So I'm trying to recode these elements as feminists in Europe as well. Okay, I would like to talk about my last work for today, which is very new. Um, it's a show that I made in summer and um, it's connected to a performance as well. I'm going to talk about both. Uh, you can see two bodies of, of works hanging from the ceiling on chains, eight costume objects, which I call social bodies, and 20 tears, which are, again, um, little resin pieces and something like assemblies within resin as a per personal archive. The costume objects are made out of two pieces, out of my own closet, so they're my own clothing, there's like a biographical level to them, but I'm opening them up and extend them with braiding, knotting, weaving, and I make these objects of modeling mass <clears throat> and they become a network. So I'm trying to look at the body as network again. And um, you could also wear them. So I've, I've, I've been wearing one of them for my performance. The tears, as I said, are something uh, like a personal archive, they are quite vulnerable, nostalgic in a way because they hang from the ceiling and they, they move quite slowly. And I included text, um, pearls, modeling mass, rope, hair, and, and uh, prints. And the texts are connected to my lecture performance. The performance was called Moonlight Sonata as well, which is linked to the Moonlight Sonata by Ludwig van Beethoven. Um, yeah, I've been making some research on Ludwig van Beethoven just because I thought it's very interesting that he probably had a biracial background and trying to process uh, Afro-German history and German archive and the whitewashing in history. And I think it's got a big, it got, it has big potential, the idea that Beethoven was black. So I made this collaboration with my good friend and colleague, um, Nathanael Amadou Kipan, who's a sound artist, um, also studying at the RCA, who recorded my voice and um, included another quite um, personal and, and strong phone call with another friend and added these echoes and fluid sounds so I was reading my texts for the performance and the sound was echoing me and I was reacting on the sound and I, I was wearing this costume and moved around the space. And yeah, the, the process started with the Moonlight Sonata, but the, the sound obviously was very different in the end. Um, yeah, so it was, it was very much about this, need for invention and reinvention uh, of, of language, also of culture in general for um, Afro-German community and thinking about what it means to be mixed in Europe. To finish my presentation, I'd like to read a few of my texts that I was reading at the performance, uh, by the way. Um, I forgot to say about Beethoven, that there are sources that kind of prove that he probably had a mixed background. There are letters and drawings that are quite realistic. And then there's these famous paintings that show him as a white person, um, which is, is quite interesting. Also the role that paintings were playing back in the days and um, Quite interesting also that all the classic musicians were powdering their faces white for events, etc. So this, the, the image below is Beethoven's death mask and the image above is a painting which is most realistic. 
Okay, I would now like to read a few parts of my performance, lecture performance text, and then um, finish with my presentation. <clears throat> Let's talk about Beethoven's background. The case rests on several possibilities. His Flemish ancestors might have married Spanish black Moors of North African descent, or maybe his mother had an affair. There's a blank spot in the archives, but it's real. What happens if we consider Beethoven as he was? He was wearing a mask, a white mask. I'm in moonshine, ninth symphony. All humans become brothers. Infinity is conditioned by the frame. Inside the frame, infinity. Infinity is conditioned by the frame. Inside the frame, the potential of infinity. The repetition behind dust and dawn, who am I? We're covered with transparency. Transparent layers protect and secure the gaze. The transparent space is infinite in space and time. The untransparency inside transparency is the harmony of dissonance. Moonshine, who am I? I'm sitting down as a fragment. You can't sort me in, you can't sort me out. I'm sorting myself out. When we think in fragments, will there be a space in between? There is no space in between because one fragment sits right next to the other, just like a mosaic. Together, they build a solid ground. We would not be lost, we'd be located in the in-between. Due, dua. Moonshine Brothers, I pick gray, another, a fragment within the moonshine. A space opens up, common sense, under commons, under common, not logistical, but it's logic, not logic, no line, but a pattern, entanglement, a space opens up, common sense, under commons. Just rearranged the pattern. He was wearing a mask, a white mask. Different in myself, different for yourself. For myself, different within yourself. For oneself, different in myself, in itself, for myself, different. Sometimes I get up and I get dizzy. I lose the ground below my feet. No solid ground, no mosaic. Because you don't get me, and I thought we spoke the same language. They're caught up in their logistics. He was wearing a mask. We've been in the human business rather than the art business. Logistics of the trade line, line trade. I'm leaving as network. Okay. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Teresa. So now, if anybody has any questions, please, um, Teresa, if you want to stop sharing your screen, then we can see everybody and people can maybe just put a hand up or type a question into the chat. OK, that's good. Right. So, yes, have we got any questions for Lisa? So, yes, Teresa, I'll start actually with one if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I really like you know, what you talked about last, kind of that you did a performance actually wearing one of your pieces. Is this something kind of you're planning to do more of? And how did you actually come about? Or what made you do that? What did you, what was your motivation to kind of think, okay, I'm going to wear something that I've made and, and perform as well as just making work? I think it was something like a, a process and something that I was going to do at some point because I've always worked with body extensions and things that, that I add on my body. And I think it was a conversation that I had in the studio 
um, last year and me starting to use my own clothing. And, um, and then on top, moving to London, like I got to know more spaces um, which were encouraging me to use my writings because I've always been writing, but I've never seen it as part of my practice. And then I got to know some spaces like the uh, like Home by Ronan McKenzie and she makes these open mics with poetry slams. And, um, and then I thought, okay, maybe it's not just writing and but it's also reading and performing. And then it was just making a lot of sense to also use my costume objects as part of part of this kind of install total installation that includes my body because I was like I, I really want to share my texts and I want to embed it into an Atanael sound piece but I'm not going to wear anything and I have these costume objects so I'm going to wear one okay. yeah <laughs> okay that's great then, really really I, I would have loved to have seen that yeah, in terms of if I got, if I keep doing it, I think this work had a lot of potential for mm -hmm. new works. I had so many ideas, like definitely, maybe not even myself, maybe even other performers and um, like having my works activated through the body. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. We'll be watching this space for sure, definitely. Excellent. Has anybody else got any questions? Oh yes, Rebecca. Hi, um, I've got a question because you talked a lot about the symbolism of um, a lot of the elements that you use in your work, but I was wondering um, about the symbol uh, symbolism behind the animals that you used in some of the earlier works you presented, because there was, well, there were some deep sea animals and there was the lion, um, so if you could collaborate on that, that would be really great. Um, I think the deep sea fish for me was such a good animal like first of all it looks kind of magical because it looks kind of mask like as well and that they're half translucent and um in and, and the lion i think it was just about this mythological potential not about the real lion itself or the real fish but the the kind of creativity in that creation because it's an interesting shape in some way so yeah, I think it's it's more about this like myth mythological connection and the potential of um, you know of creation in general. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? You can also type your question in the chat if, if you feel more comfortable doing that. Is it Francesca? I think there's somebody talking, but you yes. Okay, great. Oh, hi. Yeah, sorry. It's Annie here. Um, congratulations. What an amazing presentation. Um, I think a couple of things just really struck me. And I, I think going back um, to the idea of your appearing in your work, um, because it just seems so fitting, um, because your work it seems to have such a strong identity in itself. Um, somehow it seemed to me to be just absolutely perfect that you would then put yourself in the middle of it, um, you know, and, uh, and, and sort of speak and perform. Um, and I just wanted to say that I thought that was a really inspirational moment. And thank you. Oh, thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, hi. I think I have a question on that, actually. Um, um, so, first of all, like, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's the first time I hear you speak about your work, but um, it's great because I can see I can see a lot of points in common, which make me really excited. Mm -hmm. but there's one thing I was always curious about. Um, this thing about performing with your work, like, how did it make you feel? Like, do you have any like thoughts about it? Because I always felt really shy about that. Yeah. That's a good question because it was very much out of my comfort zone. But sometimes I have this feeling like when I feel 
it's gonna be out of my comfort zone. I really wanna do it like to, to push myself. But it was, I think for me, it felt safe to be in one space with my work. I think it's, it's just a good feeling to be in one space with your work. It gives you more confidence. And then it was a collaboration. So I don't think I would have made it alone. It's because, you know, Nathanael and I, we talked so much about performance and um, like putting trauma out on a stage. Like, what does that mean? Do we want to do that? No, actually not. We, we protected quite a few parts of the work. We even had a second version of it, but it felt too personal and too vulnerable in these spaces. Like, especially looking at who comes to these events. Um, so it was quite specific decision making and planning beforehand and then just having the script very safe script of my texts and the work and uh, um, like the physical work and the, the sound work and um, still had some there was some space for improvisation but it was fun then in the end and I think it's quite a calming and meditative performance so it kind of calmed me down at the same time because it was very, like everyone was so silent because the sound piece is quite slow and the text is kind of intimate. Um, yeah, but it was a very good experience. I would actually do it again. Yeah, it's, uh, it felt interesting. Didn't feel like anything else I ever did actually. It's very hard to com compare it, but I oh, think- thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Good question. Okay. Any anybody else? Did I see anything else? No. Okay. No. Are there any any last words by you, Teresa? to the group, I obviously would like to thank you so, so much on behalf of Absolutely Cultured and Humber Street Gallery for making time tonight, for preparing this wonderful, insightful, inspiring presentation as well. I have learned a lot and yeah, you've given me real things to think about and it's beautiful. Your work is incredibly beautiful. I am a little bit sad as well, having seen those really big pieces that you didn't manage to kind of bring them. I, I would love to see them in real. And yes, you know, hopefully we'll, we continue to work together yeah. going forward. Maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent. So yes, any words from you to everybody? Thank you very much for having me. It was such a pleasure. It was the first artist talk with presentation that I made and uh, I feel in very good hands and uh, thanks for the questions and in general I think for me it's just a big pleasure to be part of the new contemporaries and then being able to talk about my work was very good Excellent. and you've done really well you know amazing so round of applause <laughs> for Teresa remotely there we go okay so thank you to everyone as well who came along tonight and and listened to this so this is recorded and we can share it with you Teresa and then we can discuss what we'll do with the rest so thank you very much have a lovely evening and see you again sometime bye bye